All right, what is going on, guys? I am Decodiac. Today I'm here with Eric, and it's almost draft season. It's almost Labor Day weekend, which is when the majority of people's fantasy football drafts are. If you draft in Dynasty, draft whenever you want. But for season long, you should always wait till the last possible second, which is why we are drafting today in this mock draft. Now, there's been some news that's come out over the past few days that's going to impact like how we do this. Um, of course, one of the biggest ones is that Leonard Fournette got cut or waived. I mean, I don't think, well, as I said in the video, I don't think it's very surprising, but it's also surprising at the same time. And there's also been some news about Alvin Kamara lately. Uh, I think the latest is that he did not miss practice today. And Sean Payton ended up talking to him about uh, wanting to extend him. But yeah, uh, say hi, Eric. Yeah, what's up, guys? Obviously, the big news about those two running backs, Fournette and Kamara. I actually had a draft, I think, a week ago from now. We're recording this on Wednesday the 2nd. So yeah, Kamara back at camp today, back at practice. Yeah, he and Peyton sat down and talked, but I actually drafted Kamara in another league at the 106, which I thought was a steal at the time, and now that he's back at practice, I'm still very happy about that pick, but I was sitting on the ice for a few days there when I heard about Kamara being unhappy, because we all know what happened with Le'Veon Bell and Melvin Gordon, and that just crushed them in fantasy. Yep, holdouts are alive and well. So, rules for the mock draft, 12 team, PPR, 15 rounds. Uh... Normally, we do a bigger draft, but it's season long. It's not dynasty. Benches aren't deep. So, yeah, it's redraft. Now, let's get right into it. So, we actually don't know where we're going to be drafting from. Uh, Eric, you want to pull up a random number generator between 1 through 12 and tell me what spot I'm going to be picking? Yeah, I'm going to pull up a random num number generator for both of us. So, All right. Alex, you're picking from the 4 spot, and okay. I am picking from the 1 spot, actually. Yeah, that's okay. great. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think, yeah, both of us like, especially this year, being able to pick at the end of the draft because you're able to get those two running backs. But that's going to be tough for both of us here early in the yeah. draft. Yeah. Um. All right. So I guess we can start the draft whenever you're ready. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a question who's going to be your pick. Yeah, number one overall, no question. It's PPR. I mean, Christian McCaffrey is the pick here. Yeah, that is just not a question. Record-breaking season last year. Oh, man. I might have to draft. Does, does the CPU auto-pick? Okay, we're going to pause this and wait for... Let we're going to pause this. I'm just going to give us 24 hours per pick and then have the CPU auto-pick. Okay. All right, let's uh, resume this. All right, all right. So Saquon, Zeke go two and three, pretty standard. No surprises there. Pretty standard. Um, so the Alvin Kamara stuff is alive and well, but the upside is just so high for Alvin Kamara in a PPR league. I don't think I can see myself passing on him right now, even in favor of Michael Thomas. Dalvin Cook has never played a full 16. Uh, Clyde edwards alaire I wouldn't hate Clyde here. I would still say it's a bit of a reach. But uh, as I mentioned in the CEH video, the second video I made on this channel, the only running backs I think that should be going ahead of CEH are Christian McCaffrey, Saquon, Zeke, and Kamara. And so right now, I'm going to pick Alvin Kamara. Yeah, good pick there, Alex. I I think CEH is number five overall for both of us in mm -hmm. our rankings. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Kamara, the contract situation seems to be fixed, at least for now. I don't think it should impact his... Uh, 2022 badly so yeah great pick out the 104 mm -hmm. yeah and as we see the rest of the first round all of those tier two running backs off the board as we predicted Mahomes also goes at the 207 so interesting there for that team six that is a no very, running backs <laughs> that is a very very interesting strategy now I think the last guy I would have considered here would have been probably yeah Chubb, um, Aaron Jones at two hundred three. Not a fan of that pick at all. Uh, I really like the one twelve two one turn. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, but, I like that a lot too. Hmm. You know, 
I am just very unsure what to do because I don't want to take James Conner in the second round. No, dude, yeah, that's the the last thing you want to do is take James Conner. I mean, I know, and we both know that taking two running backs is the strategy you want to have in the first two rounds, but if it's James Conner in the second round, you do not want to be doing that. I mean, if I was Alex here, and it's going to be my yeah. situation in a few picks here too. Conner's off my board. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about a tight end i'm thinking yep, about chris I'm, godwin i've i've got I, my i've got my mouse over the draft travis kelsey button but uh i wouldn't have hated deandre hopkins here either you know i think one of the biggest advantages you can have over your opponent week in and week out is the surefire advantage at tight end and even though when i play the kid alone i might not have as big of an advantage i think however long the season is Week in and week out, Travis Kelsey is going to give me an unprecedented advantage over whoever else I play at the tight end spot. Yep, and you see James Conner go there at the 210, not a pick either of us. Like Godwin at the 211, pretty standard. I don't think either one of us are in love with Godwin, but we realize he's going to be going at the end of the second round regardless of what anyone else does. So not a bad pick from the computer there you took travis kelsey i have back-to-back picks here at the Mm -hmm. 212 301 turn so i'm taking george kittle tight end two arguably tight end one in season long i mean we talked about we've talked about him multiple times both in our grand league second round video and in the tight end extensions video that we made a few weeks ago love him and yeah as you mentioned the advantage at tight end over your opponents here's where it gets interesting for me Because I do think Chris Carson is a good player who should get the touches Mm -hmm. and should be, he should not be going and falling like out of the third round, but Mm -hmm. I'd really like to get him at like the 310, 311 if possible. Mm -hmm. And for people that are drafting late in the third round, you should have two running backs already if you're drafting well. So Chris Carson becomes kind of irrelevant. So I don't really know where Chris Carson falls. Not really considering him here anyway. <sighs> Lamar Jackson is sitting right there at the top of my draft queue. Mm-hmm. I really am not a huge endorser of QB early, especially in uh, single QB season long leagues. There's so many options for streaming. There's so many options for late QBs. It's mm-hmm. it's really not worth it. So <sighs> that brings it to the wide receivers, and this is where we get to picking your preference because there's Galladay, Evans, Thielen, Robinson, DJ Moore, Juju Smith-Schuster is going to have her bounce back here. You could really go with any of those guys. Personally, I'm going to take Kenny Galladay here. I don't love the value, but I had to make my pick and Matt Stafford's coming back. Galladay had a great year regardless of that anyway. And I just think the floor is pretty safe there in Detroit. Yeah, so Lamar Jackson at the 3-4 is still sitting here. I don't expect Lamar Jackson to do what he did last year just because of natural regression. I still think Lamar... Well, it's not a question as to if Lamar Jackson is a good football player or not. Like, that is not what we are arguing here. The thing that we are arguing here is if the value is worth it, considering opportunity cost and everything like that. So... This is kind of the reason why you don't want to be drafting early in the draft, because yeah, we got CMC and Kamara, but I think I'd prefer something like the 112 spot, like where the CPU got Kenyon Drake and Joe Mixon. What about you, Eric? Yeah, I completely agree. That 110 is probably my favorite pick in the draft, especially if you're in your hometown leagues and Michael Thomas is going before then, and you see Devontae Adams going at the ninth pick here. Being able to get Derrick Henry at the 110, and obviously, Miles, I wouldn't have taken Aaron Jones, but Sanders and Chubb were both on the table there. Pairing Derrick Henry with Nick Chubb or Miles Sanders is a fantastic start to the draft, as is Drake and Mixon, as would have been Eckler and one of Sanders or Chubb. Even Jones, I think Jones should not be going past the early second round. I don't love him as much as the other guys, but... Mm -hmm. To start off with two of those like second tier running backs is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, as you said, early in the draft, all right, we have our stud running back, but 
the next running backs really aren't coming to us. I mean, if you're really in love with a James Conner, Chris Carson, you think Todd Gurley or David Johnson's going to do well in their new offense, then go for it. But I don't think either of us are endorsing that. You kind of have to switch to a modified RB zero strategy where you have your stud running back and then you wait until the fifth or sixth round after securing QB or tight end after securing those starting receiver spots and probably taking a good receiver at the flex, which if I had to guess what you were going to do here, I would say you're leaning towards Allen Robinson or DJ Moore. Yep. That's exactly what I'm leaning towards. So real quick about the running backs here. I am not taking David Johnson at the three, four. That is just not a pick I'm going to make. I am not taking Todd Gurley, Jonathan Taylor, three, four. I would be hammering that in dynasty, but this is not dynasty. Yeah, this I mean, in, in dynasty, John, Jonathan Taylor's already gone. I yeah, mean, yeah, long gone. Uh, I'm sure as hell not taking Leonard Fournette. I am sure as hell not taking Le'Veon Bell. The only running back I would even consider here would be Melvin Gordon, and even then, I think I like Allen Robinson and DJ Moore a lot more. And yep. I am going to go with DJ Moore here because when you think about Joe Brady and Matt Rule, the guys they just brought into their coaching staff, uh, they were able to make some really good things happen in Baylor and LSU. You know, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson were great in the red zone, and Rule was able to use Denzel Mims and just make him absolutely lethal. So the picks after DJ Moore, Adam Thielen, David Johnson, OBJ, Amari Cooper, Todd Gurley, Jonathan Taylor, Lamar Jackson goes at the 311. Now, I would definitely say that's a pretty good value pick. Allen Robinson, 312. Calvin Ridley, 41. Melvin Gordon, 42. AJ Brown, 43. Leonard Fournette at the 44. That is currently a waste of a fourth round pick. Juju yeah, Smith don't Schuster. expect that. Yeah, yeah. If you if you're drafting this weekend, uh Please do not use this as a tool to predict how your league mates will draft because one, Sleeper still hasn't updated this, and two, every draft is different. So don't rely on this as something that you could just be like, oh, I'm going to get Mark Andrews at the 4 6 because he went at the 4 7 and Kodiak's mock draft. No, don't talk about that. So, as I mentioned, Le'Veon Bell 4 6, Mark Andrews 4 7, Cooper Cup 4 8. Now, there are still some pretty good receivers here, and, uh, this is why running backs get hit so hard early, because think about all the guys we have here. Robert Woods, DK Metcalf, DJ Shark, Terry McLaurin, uh, Tyler Lockett, Keenan Allen, Cortland Sutton. Now, I'm trying to see who else is on the board. I think 4-9 would be a little too early for Dak. If you think Kyler Murray is just going to blow up the league this year, that is a definite possibility. Although, I'm still thinking about grabbing two stud receivers here you know we already got our stud tight end and i am actually going to go with a man who eric is in love with he actually ended up yep. trading for i think about yep. three weeks ago in our main league in dynasty i had this guy last year and he burned me to start the year but i think robert woods is going to have a bounce back season he finished around where he should have last year but he burned me to begin with. I think he's not going to score two touchdowns again. The Rams offense switching to 12 personnel made Robert Woods a huge beneficiary, and Cooper Cup was the person who was not the beneficiary, and he goes one pick before Woods in this mock draft. Yeah, I expect Cup and Woods to go pretty closely together. I mean, mm -hmm. you talk about the bad luck that Woods had with touchdowns. I think he had like a touchdown percentage below 2% last year, which is something like either a third or a quarter of his career touchdown percentage. So expect that number to go up from two touchdowns that he only had last year. <laughs> I, I know Jared Goff loves Cooper Cup, and there's something to be said about QB wide receiver chemistry, but you did see once the Rams started going more to 12 personnel after the Cooks, after they just stopped playing Brandon Cooks at all, Mm -hmm. that Cooper Cup just was not as effective on the outside as he was in the slot, which is where he's been playing for his career other than the end of last season. He did get very lucky with some touchdowns, and I still do think that he is Jared Goff's favorite red zone target. But between the 20s, just racking up catches, racking up yards, and he should get more than two touchdowns, Robert Woods is the guy to draft in the Rams offense. Absolutely. So. 
I have back-to-back picks here again at the 412-51. And Tyler Lockett just went in front of me. Mark Ingram just went. I, I would not consider Mark Ingram at all. I think Mark Ingram at best is going to be pretty decent in the first five or six weeks until J.K. Dobbins just takes over that offense. Um, it could be even less than five or six weeks. But regardless, Mark Ingram will not be a factor for you in the fantasy playoffs, which I know the regular season matters in fantasy. You've got to get to the playoffs. But you really want those guys who are going to be able to win you the league in weeks 14, 15, 16 when you're going for that trophy. So Mark Ingram, not a guy I'd consider. The running back's still on the table. Devin Singletary, I really don't like. Raheem Moster had a few monster weeks at the end of last season. I know he had a pretty good Super Bowl. But uh, again, I'm just, he's what, 27? And they still have a plenty of running backs on that depth chart. Tevin Coleman, yeah, Jeff Wills. Like, if you're going to take, I don't, I don't take a running back that broke out when he was 27 or 28, take Kenyon Drake, bro. Yeah, honestly, Kenyon Drake has the opportunity. We, he went the end of the first round obviously yeah cam Akers would be the one guy i'd consider at the four or five turn but before i take him i'm looking straight at wide receiver again tyler lockett just went in front and you see these this trio of wide receivers at the top of the queue right here dk metcalf dj chark and terry mclaurin i love all of these guys i think i like dj chark and terry mclaurin slightly more than dk metcalf and here's why. The Seahawks absolutely love to run the football. And there's no indication from the Seahawks that they're going to be a bad team this year at all. I mean, they ran the football a ton last year. Chris Carson was fantasy relevant because of it. Russell Wilson's a beast, but they just don't have the passing volume in games enough where DK Metcalf has a reliable floor for you. Yeah, he can go off. He's a great deep threat. So is Tyler Lockett. Both of them are going to have monster weeks this year. I just, I don't know if people are going to be able to reliably pick which one of them goes off or when they'll go off. I don't think they go off based on matchups or anything like that. It's like a Mike Evans, like Mike Evans will have his big games, but you don't, you don't know when they're going to come. So a guy like DJ Chark, who is, the bona fide top option on his offense. They just waved Leonard Fournette, so they're not running the ball at all. DJ Chark, a guy I'm hammering here at 412 to go with Kenny Galladay. So here at the 5-1, I'd say, again, we have Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf. Even Keenan Allen is someone I like. Um, I, I mean, he's not young. He's not going to do better than last season, but yeah. not a terrible pick in the fifth round, but I think my decision here is between Cam Akers, young running back, could be the RB2. I would like to hold out, see if either Swift or Dobbins makes it through. I don't think Alex's pick. I think Alex's pick at the 609 is going to be where he tries to hammer J.K. Dobbins. So Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll be able to get him. But I I do think I can wait for my RB2. Again, doing that sort of modified RB0 strategy. I have Christian McCaffrey, who's basically two running backs in one. He, I mean, 26 points a game. That's absolutely insane. So for my flex spot, I'm going to hit Terry McLaurin, another guy, wide receiver one in his offense. You can see him right behind Alex there, his jersey. Absolute yeah. stud, Scary Terry. So in between Scary Terry and DK Metcalf, uh, or no, so in between Scary Terry and my pick, DK Metcalf and the guy Eric said he would consider here if he were to hammer running back, has just gone off the board. Now, I know we're both doing a modified RB0 strategy right now. T.Y. Hilton, not on my board. Cortland Sutton, nope. I would absolutely love here. But the thing is, we have so many mouths to feed in Denver. I know anyone who watched the Broncos last year could tell that Cortland Sutton was by far and away our best offensive player. But bringing in Melvin Gordon, uh, bringing in Jerry Judy, who knows how the ball's going to get distributed. I know Cortland Sutton is a great real-life receiver, but I don't know if you can just rely on Drew Locke, and I'm saying this as a Broncos fan who absolutely loves Drew Locke. I don't know if you can rely on Drew Locke to give Cortland Sutton fantasy-relevant volume. I really like Keenan Allen here, but same thing. They have mouths to feed, and also, who knows how Keenan Allen's going to do with Tyrod Taylor. Um, 
Marquise Brown, not taking him here. Stephon Diggs, not taking him here. AJ Green, definitely not taking him here. Uh, so I think the only guy, you know, this might be considered a bit of a reach, but I'm going to get my RB2 right now. The Tampa Bay offense is projected to be great this year. Actually, the Tampa Bay offense was great last year, and guess what? They have an upgrade at quarterback. Now, we've talked about how Tom Brady is going to be great for winning in football games. Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, we don't know what their passing volume is going to look like, especially with Gronk there. But, you know, in a Bruce Arians offense, Bruce Arians knows how to use a running back with a good quarterback. You saw it with in 2016 with Carson Palmer and David Johnson. I think my RB2 is going to go off the board right here. It's going to be Ronald Jones. And Eric, I know you're a Patriots fan, so you got any insight to this pick for me? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what you said in terms of how the Bucks are going to be probably a worse passing offense in terms of volume, but they are going to be a significantly better football team. And what do you want? for your for any running back you have is you want legitimate carries and unless it's a guy like Christian McCaffrey or Saquon who's just going to be a beast regardless of how their team does you want positive game scripts you want teams to be up and you want teams to be pounding the rock up 10 points 14 points 17 points late in games and that's exactly what the Bucks are going to do with Ronald Jones the one concern I have with Ronald Jones is I don't know exactly how talented he is Mm-hmm. in terms of being my head and shoulders a bit of ahead of Keyshawn Vaughn or LaShawn McCoy. But the one advantage he does have is that he knows their system and that Bruce Arians has already coached him before. I, Bruce Arians has never coached LaShawn McCoy to my knowledge. And Bruce Arians has definitely never coached Keyshawn mm-hmm. Vaughn, who is a rookie and played zero NFL games. And especially with the COVID season limited training camp I do think that gives a bit of an advantage to Ronald Jones so not a bad pick here at all so at the 609 you already know who I'm gonna take at the 607 in our dynasty startup I was able to get JK Dobbins the reason we talked about Mark Ingram being a bad pick at 410 is because if Mark Ingram goes down at all this year whether it's due to injury due to COVID he is not getting his job back JK Dobbins was a first rounder on the Ravens board And even though the Ravens could use better depth uh, on the defensive side of the ball, they chose to spend a second round pick on J.K. Dobbins. So this could be a very Miles Sanders-esque situation uh, where J.K. Dobbins takes a little bit. He might not be amazing uh, when the season first starts, but you know what? If this team is good enough to get to the playoffs, J.K. Dobbins is certainly good enough to move the needle. Yep. Completely agree. It would have been my pick at the 6-12 here, but sadly I can't. Um, so looking at my team now, got Christian McCaffrey, got George Kittle, got three wide receivers who I absolutely love for 2020. I have to go back to at least one running back, and I think I'm going to hit two here. First is going to be Antonio Gibson. Washington, I really don't believe in their offense. I, I don't even know how good Antonio Gibson's going to be. But if Washington does have a running back that provides any sort of significant fantasy value this year, it's going to be Antonio Gibson. I mean, a fantastic player in college. I think Washington really likes him. We'll see how successful he can be in terms of how bad their offense is going to be. But And I, I really don't love stacking Terry McLaurin and Antonio Gibson, but I think two young players who have an, a huge opportunity to break out even further. So that's my pick there. And my second pick here is going to be Zach Moss. Two rookie running backs off the board in Gibson and Moss. Um, Now, Moss is someone who's been climbing draft ladders. I mean, if if you had told me back in July that Zach Moss was going at the 7-1, I would be like, "You're, you're freaking crazy. But all the reports out of camp say that they want to use him as both their goal line back and their receiving back. And if we're in a PPR league and we're talking about high upside touches you want the goal line work to score six points off a touchdown and you want the receiving the receiving work because you can get one yard on a catch but it's still 11 or 1 1.1 points in a ppr league which is significantly better than a four yard carry up the middle that gets you only four four or 0.4 points in a 
fantasy league, which is exactly the type of runs that Singletary is going to be getting. So I, that's why I like Zach Moss. And again, if Singletary goes down, then he becomes a fantastic fantasy player. Yep. And so between Zach Moss and my pick, we have Devontae Parker and Stephon Diggs. Both guys I would not be touching right here. I think Devontae Parker was just lucky that Preston Williams got hurt and his team was losing by four touchdowns every single game. Stephon Diggs, the Buffalo Bills are a run-heavy offense, especially with Josh Allen. Josh Allen has been, I think, the least accurate deep ball quarterback in the league. Stephon Diggs is a deep threat. And what does Kirk Cousins do better than anyone else? He slings it deep. I think Kirk Cousins had the third or second best deep ball accuracy uh, last year. So... Since we are drafting today, the day is, let me check my phone, September 2nd, 2017. Since we are drafting today, and there's just... 2017? Two... Oh, <laughs> that's my bad. If this, was tw- if this was 2017, I would have taken uh, Todd Gurley at 101, probably. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we knew what was going to happen, but yeah, it's September 2nd, 2020, not 2017, there is just too much uncertainty regarding the Kamara situation. And I know the reports today have been increasingly positive. And if I had Dalvin Cook, I may do something somewhere right here. But I am going to handcuff at, with my seventh round pick just because of how risky the whole situation is. Latavius Murray, when Kamara did not play last year, put up RB1 numbers. And I think that is worth a seventh round pick. He put up better. He put up not only RB one numbers, but he was the RB one over those two games that Camaro was completely out for. I think he put up thirty game weeks both weeks that Camaro was out in PPR. Mm-hmm. He put up I think three hundred yards rushing, receiving four touchdowns over those two. I mean, he was absolutely insane while Camaro was out. So, not a bad move. I mean, guys like Deshaun Watson still on the board, but I. Julian Edelman, I mean, he's going to be a PPR beast, but I'm not in love with him. Yeah, I do. I do agree with that. You need to secure your RB1. I really can't do the same thing with McCaffrey because I don't even know if I could tell you who the backup running back on Carolina is. And even if even if CMC were to go down, they're not going to be able to replicate CMC's production like Latavius Murray will if Kamara goes down or holds out. So, yeah. All right. So. I think right here I would like a little bit more stable production at wide receiver. And I'm looking at Jarvis Landry right now. The thing about Jarvis Landry is that the Browns are going to be such a run-heavy offense with Hub, no, Hunt and Chubb, excuse me. And uh, But let me see who else is on the board because I haven't really been uh, keeping up. Okay, we have Carry On, not on my board. We have Hunter Henry made of glass. Josh Allen is, might actually be a pretty good pick here. Um, right now, it's, for me, right now, it's between Josh Allen and Jarvis Landry. I think even though with, uh, yeah, so even though with, with Cleveland wanting to become such a run-heavy offense, I think Jarvis Landry has just been too consistent over the course of his career where I can't really afford to pass on him, especially because I only have, let me see, one, two receivers on my roster. So I think I'm getting a pretty good wide receiver three here, especially at the 8-9. Yeah, and he's probably going to be your starting flex looking at your roster. I mean, J.K. Dobbins more of a late-season stash. I do love him and expect him to be a late-season beast. But uh, for week one, I think... Camara and Rojo in your starting in your starting running back spots. I think Landry takes over that flex spot over J.K. Dobbins and Latavius Murray, at least for the time being. That's really tough, though. The two players who I was, I think I was going to take at the mm-hmm. turn went at eight ten and eight eleven. Matt Ryan and C.D. Lamb. So I'm going to have to change my strategy a little bit. Uh, yeah, C.D. Lamb, I love. I mean, Dallas. It's just going to be an insane offense, regardless of how good of a football team they are. Dak will spread out the ball to his weapons, and CeeDee Lamb's not even the number one option. He'll be able to get open against number two corners or slot corner. It just it'll be too easy for him in that offense. Matt Ryan in season long, I actually do like more than Josh Allen, but still, my pick at the eight twelve here is going to be Josh Allen. 
just because I think his rushing upside will give him a great floor regardless of how much he passes the ball or how well he passes the ball. I think he'll be a fine QB1 for me. Um, Talking about Matt Ryan a little bit more, I would take him over Josh Allen solely because Atlanta is one of those fantasy situations where it's like they suck on offense one year. Or not even suck, Mm -hmm. but they're middle of the road one year. And then the next year, for no reason, they just explode because everyone's underrating them. I think that could be a situation we see here, especially on the passing side with Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, and Matt Ryan. So I slightly like Matt Ryan more for that upside. He could finish as a top three QB, honestly, in fantasy. But uh, with him off the board, Josh Allen was the obvious pick. Here's where my pick becomes a little bit questioning. I have CMC. I have two young running backs. Haven't taken a wide receiver in a little bit. Uh, People I'm looking at, it it seems a little bit early for me to take Damian Harris, although I do like him, especially as reports about Sony Michelle's injury just keep coming back a little bit negative there. I I don't think Sony Michelle's that good. And we know how New England is. If he's not being, if he's not going to be able to play, then they're going to use Damian Harris as a bell cut. I mean, James White's just going to get the receiving work. We know what James White does, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, but yeah. Bless you. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to look receiver here, and a lot of rookies on the board. Debo Samuel, I would love to take him here. He would already be gone if not for his injury. But again. He's going to be out for the first half of the season, and I don't even know what he's going to look like when he comes back. He has a a foot injury, and we know how those can affect wide receivers, their ability to cut, their ability to run after the catch. He's just going to be, in my opinion, really limited even when he does come back. Emmanuel Sanders, kind of like a dish. I think he's going to become like a Deshaun Jackson kind of receiver who could be great for you in some weeks, but I don't, I just don't know when I'm going to put him in my lineup on like a bye week i am looking right now at the trio of rookie receivers here rugs rager and judy now rager injury because of the injury he's off my board obviously if we get better news about that in the future he would be right around this pick but we have rugs the deep threat and judy the secure target and i'm going to take jerry judy here i think denver's offense is going to be pretty good this year and judy is one of the reasons why i mean you got Cortland sutton as the number one x receiver there Judy is kind of going to be their Swiss Army knife and do everything in the offense. So, I really, I just really like the Jerry Judy pick here. It, he could explode and become an absolute fantasy stud, or he could be bad. But it's we're already in the ninth round, so not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, not a big deal at all. All right, looking at now, the one thing I don't have on my team besides kicker or defense, we're not even going to discuss that until no. like, way later. Um, the one thing I do not have right now is a quarterback. Now, as I mentioned at the very, 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 very end of the Dynasty startup video, the second round video, quarterbacks that I think could be the next Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes. And when I say that, I am not saying that they are going to be as good or they are going to light the league on fire. I'm talking about late round quarterbacks that could end up being a very good QB1. Uh, Daniel Jones, Drew Locke, Gardner Minshew, and Sam Darnold. Now, they are all on the board right now, and I think I'm actually going to wait because there are still some pretty good tight ends on the board, and with the 9-4, I'm going to take Jared Cook because I didn't realize he was still on the board, and (laughs) even though I took Travis Kelsey at, let me see, what was it? I think the 2-9, yeah, second round. So even though I took Travis Kelsey at the 2-9, I think Jared Cook is going to be amazing this year. Even though I had Jared Cook last year, he's another guy like Robert Woods that just completely burned me some weeks. Uh, After he came back from his injury or the bye week, I can't remember, there was not a single game where he did not put up double-digit points. So, Jared Cook, uh, Dynasty, don't even ask me about Jared Cook unless you pair him with Adam Troutman. But for season long, I think Jared Cook is going to be great in 2020. Now, there are still other tight ends on the board. Noah Fan, Austin Hooper, TJ Hawkinson. Don't even ask me about Mike Gusecki. Um But yeah, the one thing I don't have right now is a quarterback. And when it comes to these later rounds, it just comes down to who you prefer. I think Minshew's 
rushing floor provides him with some great upside for this year, especially because the Jaguars are not going to be a good football team. Their defense is horrible. Uh, they have no running game now, so they're going to be airing it out, especially to DJ Chark and LaVisca Chenault. Yeah, I agree with that take. I think probably, I mean, you said it comes down to preference, and if, if Gardner Minshew's your guy, then go out and get him. I think you probably could have waited until that like 12th round yeah. to get him, but I mean, if if there are people in your league who you know like him, if he doesn't go in the first round because someone wants to get a free case of Bud Light, then uh, yeah, Gardner Minshew, a guy I absolutely love, especially once uh, Leonard Fournette has been cut. Mm-hmm. So the turn comes back to me. Could be looking at another quarterback to pair with Josh Allen because he does play some tough teams. I know the Patriots defense is weaker, but I think they're still pretty decent. Um, Maybe looking at another quarterback, but again, yeah, you talk about guys like Drew Locke, Sam Darnold. They're going to be there later in the draft. Even Cam Newton is a good late round flyer although i imagine he'll go in the 11th at some point i'm gonna go back to wide receiver and i'm gonna hit another rookie and it's gonna be justin jefferson of the minnesota vikings a guy who was an absolute beast at lsu and i know no nfl offense is gonna replicate what lsu did last year but if we talk about guys who you want to take flyers on in the late round you don't want to be taking guys who probably won't get any better than they were last year I'm looking at, I mean, Darius Slayton and Sterling Shepard could both be the wide receiver one in New York, but they also are taking away from each other. Adrian Peterson's right here, but he's just not going to, when are you going to put him in your lineup? Yeah, he might have decent production and end up being a top 25 running back by the season's end, but you're, he's just going to sit on your bench the whole year, even if he does that. It's just, unless you're completely injury riddled. Tony Pollard, decent handcuff, but again, his production is completely based on whether Zeke goes down. You want guys who are going to be better than what they are projected to do. You want guys who have that shot of being a top 20, top 15 player at their position because you don't really know what's going to happen. And I, I again, I I might you might say I have rookie fever here drafting four rookies in the last 5 rounds with Gibson, Moss, Judy and Jefferson, but if you look at the opportunities they have, their situations can really only get better considering they have not done anything in the NFL yet. And if they do poorly, then it's fine because I'm assuming that risk. If they don't play or their teams don't like them or they're just not really able to do anything at the NFL level. But my team is set up with Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle, and three wide receivers who are good that any bonus production is really just that it's just that it's just a bonus is Mm -hmm. if Antonio Gibson breaks out then yeah I have my RB2 I all the only position I have questions about is that RB2 and I'm hoping Gibson or Moss can become that that stud or even serviceable enough to fill that RB2 role or if not hopefully Judy or Jefferson breaks out and makes one of my wide receivers expendable so I can trade them for an RB2 but again this is the strategy you want to go into with your draft. It's not having this strategy before your draft because you have no idea what's going to happen. You want to take value wherever you can get it. You want to take players that you really like throughout the draft. But if this happens and you're in a situation where you can't get that second running back in the second round and it's a little bit too early to get a James Conner, Chris Carson, or... I mean, if David Johnson or Todd Gurley fell to you in the fourth or fifth round, I wouldn't be hugely opposed to that. But you're going to have to go with the strategy of just taking your stud running back in the first four picks and then pivoting away from running back for a long time and then just taking these high upside guys. We saw it last year with Miles Sanders, who was a league winner. If you did this strategy last year, got Miles Sanders in the sixth, in the late sixth, early seventh, like with an Antonio Gibson or Zach Moss, then you probably won your league. And that's the strategy I'm trying to employ here. Again, it's it's not optimal. I would love to have a late first round pick, but this is just what you're going to have to do in drafts. Um, so yeah, my other pick I haven't even made yet, but <laughs> before going on that rant, um, I have Kittle. I would consider Fant here. 
or Hawkinson if I didn't have him, but I'm an, I really don't even think if you have Kittle or Kelsey. I mean, you took a backup tight end, Jared Cook. I think that's more of trade bait personally. Um, if you have if you have Kelsey Kittle or Andrews, even Ertz or Waller, like don't take a backup tight end. It's really not worth it. You can always find someone on the free agent wire. Um, I think I'm going to go back up quarterback here, and I am going to go with a guy who produced in fantasy when he was healthy. And the only reason he's going this late in drafts is because he just wasn't healthy last year. He, all the reports about Ben Roethlisberger says he looks great, says he feels great. You can think what you want about him as a person, but Pittsburgh's offense, I mean, with Ben Roethlisberger at the helm, it's always been good. And he still has Juju. He still has James Conner, James Washington, and uh, Deontay Johnson, and even Chase Claypool are all really good young options there at receiver. So I think a bounce back year is coming up for Ben Roethlisberger, and he's my backup quarterback. So it, worst comes to worst, I just cut him to the free agent wire. Yeah, so in between Roethlisberger and my pick, we have Adrian Peterson, who he is just not on my board. I would not even take him in the 15th round if he fell to me. Uh, Mikkel Hardman at 11-3. Now, that could actually be a really good pick because if Tyreek Hill goes down, we saw what Sammy Watkins can do last year. And Sammy Watkins, let's be honest, like he's, I personally don't think he's that great of a wide receiver. I think he's overpaid. I think he's overrated because of the draft capital and draft pedigree he got coming into the NFL. Uh, his first two years, he was great with Buffalo. But after that, he's just been completely underwhelming. I know he had a decent Super Bowl. One game does not make him a great receiver. Uh, so yeah, Michael Hartman at 11-3. I actually really like that pick. Now, at we have a lot of running backs who could or could not produce on my team. And I would take Kate. You know what? I'm just going to take Keyshawn Vaughn here because the risk that Rojo busts I wouldn't say it's super high, but I'd say it's medium as well, because we have never seen Ronald Jones be a very good producer. And even though we think Tampa Bay's offense, actually, I think it's pretty safe to predict that Tampa Bay's offense will be pretty good um, for the real life NFL. And Keyshawn Vaughn is going to be the backup to Ronald Jones to start the year, but if Ronald Jones goes down, I think I'm handcuffing both my running backs. I mean, for a 11th round pick I do not hate Keyshawn Vaughn here at all yeah neither do I and again it's in the 11th round so you don't want those guys that you don't want a safe pick in the 11th round because if it's a safe pick that means they have absolutely zero ceiling (laughs) whatsoever you want a risky pick I mean yeah Keyshawn Vaughn could end up scoring six fantasy points on the entire season but he could also end up as you said with a Rojo injury or a Rojo just being unproductive, being the starting running back there in Tampa Bay, which should be a good offense again with positive game scripts that I talked about when you drafted Rojo. So yeah, not a bad pick here. The only bad picks really in rounds like this are a guy like Duke Johnson. Like he might be a flex play for you if you get screwed by bye weeks, maybe, but he's just going to sit on your bench. And he's going to put up enough points to where you don't want to drop him, but he's not going to put up enough points to ever be in your starting lineup. It's, there's no point to it whatsoever. Yeah, like at least Keyshawn Vaughn could crack my starting lineup. Uh, I do not see, especially with Kamara, the Tampa Bay running back, J.K. Dobbins. I just don't know how anyone could ever use Duke Johnson. The only running back around this range that I think I could use is Tony Pollard, and that's if Zeke goes down, which you cannot bank on because Zeke is one of the healthiest and most durable running backs in the whole league. So at 12-9, uh, the guy at the top of the board is Preston Williams. I could double dip on quarterback right here, but I think I can wait around to get uh, another guy that I really like. And I think at 12-9, we are going to get Preston Williams because. Preston Williams, before his injury last year, had equal stats to Devontae Parker. Now, if you're getting equal stats to the wide receiver one, that means you're a pretty good football player. And I think, I don't know everything about the Dolphins. I am I live on the other side of the country. I don't necessarily follow the Miami Dolphins closely. 
but I think Fitzmagic is going to be the week one quarterback. Now, if that is the case, uh, he was a watered-down version of Jameis last year where he was kind of fuck it and chuck it, and I think that will be great for any fantasy receiver. Uh, I don't think Gusecki's good at all, and yeah, I think Preston Williams at 12-9, that's a pick I can definitely get behind. Yeah, I completely. He actually out targeted Devontae Parker when he was healthy before the ACL tear. Could be some question marks coming back. Um, and if he doesn't perform this year, um, we talk about how many, or I don't even know if we talk about, but I hear about it all the time is players from the, in their second year off ACL surgery are just, I don't know what it is, but they absolutely boom and people keep talking about the injuries. So if Preston Williams, again, a guy who could be great this year as the wide receiver one, I could easily see him outperforming Devonte Parker there. But if he doesn't perform this year, again, 12th round, all of these guys at the end of the draft need to be people that you are absolutely fine with cutting if there's a guy on waivers that you want to pick up. Mm-hmm. And Preston Williams is a guy like that. If he doesn't perform, then he doesn't perform and you drop him. We'll be If he doesn't perform, we'll be one of my top sleepers next year. Um, and if he does perform, then you have another starter level player in your lineup. And again, only I think what you're only fourth wide receiver on your roster, so yeah, some good security at that position. Mm-hmm. Now for me here, I was again another player that just got stolen from me right before the pick. I was looking at Rykel Armstead because another running back. I only have three on my roster, who I saw as a just a boom bust guy. Um, and there <laughs> there really is not anyone else here. At running back that I like and again it's one of the things I hate about picking at this spot is I kind of need to take a running back because I only have three I have Kittle I have two quarterbacks I have a fine receiving core I would potentially look at Ayuk but I already have enough rookie receivers that I'm going to be fine so I I guess the pick is is Chris Thompson just because I, I don't I don't see anyone else here I like and Chris Thompson if the if the Jags just throw all the time, which I think they could, then Chris Thompson just will be on the field more than any other running back there and will get the catches, hopefully. And if he, again, if he doesn't, then I'm fine dropping him. And my other pick before I end up taking defense and kicker in the last two rounds is going to be Brandon Ayuk. Just, I think his opportunity there with Debo Samuel out, I know he has some injury questions of his own, but again, Risk reward could be the wide receiver one on San Francisco's offense, which isn't very pass heavy. But you know, if he's a wide receiver one on any offense in today's NFL, is going to be putting up fine fantasy numbers. So Brandon Ayuk, my pick there. I probably will end up dropping him for the first guy off waivers. <laughs> yeah, you got to be fine with doing that, especially if you're playing in a league that has thin benches. Okay, so. My last pick here, I'm going to double dip on quarterback. If I were to take a running back here, I think the rest of my team is fine. I have a backup tight end, which I honestly regret right now. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I know. I was going to (laughs) say a little early on Jared Cook. Yeah, but uh, I have a backup tight end. Uh, I have have solid running backs and wide receivers up and down the board who could boom and could end up never starting for me. Like, Jarvis Landry is a complete floor uh, floor play. If I were to take a running back right here, I would have taken run AMC Anthony McFarland because Anthony McFarland was a fourth-round pick by Pittsburgh. And, yeah, we had heard some stuff about how, like, Anthony McFarland's character is absolutely atrocious. His uh, personality, one scout described, was like a child. But... One of the coaches at Maryland now works for the Steelers. And do you think the Steelers wouldn't have made that pick if they really were that concerned about Anthony McFarland? Um, Yeah, so Anthony McFarland would be who I would take in this last round if I really, really, really desperately needed a running back. Because, again, you draft early, uh, you're probably going to have to be doing some sort of what, 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 we had to do. So I think like I said, I've just been kept I've just been saying it over and over again. Uh if I had to take a running back, run AMC. But yeah, um the last guy 
I'm going to take is a quarterback from my hometown team. I know I said that we don't know if he's going to be able to support a fantasy-relevant team or not, but Drew Locke is the pick here because there is just so much upside. I mean, he's got rushing floor. or No, he doesn't have rushing floor, but he has rushing ability, and I think in the modern NFL you need at least a bit of mobility if you want to be somewhat decent of a quarterback. So, yeah, uh, with my last pick here, I am going to take Drew Locke. Yeah, and to add to what you were saying about AMC, I think, I mean, obviously we're going to take defense and kicker, kicker and defense here in the last two rounds, as you see a lot of the computer teams doing the same. If you did make the mistake, and I do think it's a mistake, taking a defense or kicker before the last two rounds, if your league still even does that, I mean, I personally think kickers in fantasy are really stupid. But if you did make that mistake or if you won the championship last year and you ended up taking Justin Tucker in the ninth round. So you're like, all right, screw it. I'm going to do it again. Cause it worked for me last mm-hmm. year. Anthony McFarland is a guy like that. Who's probably going to go undrafted. So just take a flyer on him in the 15th. I mean, yeah. everyone else is going to be taking defenses and kickers. He's that late round flyer. He'll be the first guy dropped. If there's someone on waivers you want, but again, a shot at a guy who could start. We know how injury prone James Conner is. Mm-hmm. It's guys like that. Don't take, I don't don't take like Jarek McKinnon. <laughs> yeah, don't take Carlos Hyde. Don't take Lashawn McCoy. Don't take Jalen Richard. You know they're gonna be terrible. Now, I think my kicker choice right here. Uh, let me see. When you think about kickers, like you draft teams. I I don't even know why we're discussing this because I don't want to. I don't yeah. think you should play with kickers anymore if you do. But uh, I think we look at teams. The, big, the NFC South is the Big 12 of the NFL. They don't play defense down there in the NFC South, so we are going to draft Young Way Koo. Yep, Young Way Koo, good pick there. Guys, I, I yeah, when I'm looking at a guy I want to draft as my kicker, I look at, I think, One two or three main dome teams. That's yeah, two or saying. three main teams. I look at, the first of all, the offense they're on. Is the offense they're on going to be good? You see Justin Tucker off the board early. You see Harrison Butker off the board early. You see Will Lutz off the board early. Those are the top three kickers taken in any fantasy draft. Next, you look at do they play in either yeah warm weather or indoors. An indoor kicker is going to get eight games indoors every season. Maybe more if their divisional opponents have a dome like Young Way Koo does. They can't get rained on. They can't get winded on. They can't ever have a bad kicking condition. So they're going to have eight games where they're just probably going to be pretty accurate. And then the third thing I do look at is kicking ability. I, it's really hard to judge kickers. I mean, if there's a guy who you think's just simply not that accurate as a kicker, then don't take him. But it's kickers are just so annoying in fantasy because the only guys that really make a difference are like Tucker, Butker, and Lutz. And mm-hmm. Everyone else is just kind of there in a jump. I mean, I, I'll take, I guess I'll take Boswell here just because he's top of the board. I kick, again, that kind of goes what I, against what I said. I do think Pittsburgh's offense is going to be better than Houston's so this year. But yeah, Kami Fairbairn plays indoors. The Texans were at least a decent offense last year, but I think the departure of Hopkins will affect that. It's just not really a big deal. Now with defenses. There are the top defenses. You saw them go in the 11th round. Niners will be a good defense. Steelers will be a good defense. Bills should be a good defense. Ravens, yeah, those are like the top four. However, if you look at year-to-year fantasy defense production, only 25% of defenses in the top five repeat as top five fantasy defenses from the next year. No defense in the top three from a season has gone on to be the number one defense in the next year. Now, again, that could change the Steelers' defense. I don't see any reason they should be worse, but there's no point in reaching on defense when there's literally no positional stability from year to year. So what to look for in the defense? Personally, I like to stream defenses. So what I look for is week one opponent, and the Philadelphia Eagles play Washington in week one. Plain and simple. Just look for that week one opponent. Maybe they have a very easy schedule. 
It's why I really like the Bills defense. I've been drafting them a lot. Because they play the Jets and they play, who do they play in week two? They play, yeah, they play the Jets in Miami in the first two weeks. It's it's just going to be a cakewalk of a schedule for the Bills, I think, in the first two weeks. And I'm fine again because they're my defense. I'm fine dropping them because I didn't waste an early pick. Yep. And so the top defenses right here are the Buccaneers, Saints, uh, completely off my board, not taking an NFC South defense whatsoever. You know, they're, we're getting to the point where these are some decent real-life defenses, but in all honesty, like, none of these are actually going to be, like, actually legitimate good defenses. But for fantasy, what do we want? We want sacks. We want turnovers. The Chiefs' defense is no longer as horrible as it once was. And with Patrick Mahomes there, the big money man, they're going to be up ahead in games. Their other teams are going to be throwing the ball. The Chiefs are going to get pick sixes. They're going to get sacks. And even though I still don't think they're that great of a defense, uh, they're not as horrible as they once were. And in fantasy, all we care about are sacks, touchdowns, and interceptions, and that's what the Chiefs are going to give us. Yep, I completely agree. Uh, I mean, not a terrible... There's really no good pick you could have made there, and there's no bad pick you could have made there. It's 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 just sort of whatever other picks for defenses that i would like if like again as we were the last two teams to pick defenses in this mock the colts play jacksonville in week one i mean it's not a great option obviously i i just if you're streaming defenses which is what you should be doing i think in, in a league that's 12 teams or smaller just look for matchup plain and simple look for matchup unless the defense is absolutely atrocious i mean an exa- what what's an example of that i think the um yeah i don't think the bills have a very good offense but i don't think the jets defense is going to be good enough where i can accurately predict that they're going to be able to stop buffalo's offense <laughs> it's like all right they have a good matchup but they're also a terrible defense but any defense in the top 20 that has a good matchup, that's what you want to be hammering for that week in your streaming option, plain and simple. Yep, and I know there's been some hype about the Cardinals' defense lately because uh, Brett Coleman made a video about them. That is just not the case. Uh, Arizona plays in the AFC West. They're going to be playing against other good teams. Vance Joseph is their defensive coordinator. In Dynasty in the last round, if you're playing in a league with defenses, sure, but Arizona just should not be a defense you're drafting. All right, so we are finally finished with the draft. I'm going to read off Eric's team. Josh Allen, Christian McCaffrey, Antonio Gibson, Kenny Galladay, DJ Chark, George Kittle, Terry McLaurin, Chris Boswell, Eagles defense, Zach Moss, Jerry, Judy, Justin Jefferson, Ben Roethlisberger, Chris Thompson, Brandon Ayuk. And then I'm going to be reading off my team. Gardner Minshew, Alvin Kamara, Ronald Jones, DJ Moore, Robert Woods, Travis Kelsey, J.K. Dobbins, Young Wei Koo, Chiefs defense, Latavius Murray, Jarvis Landry, Jared Cook, Keyshawn Vaughn, Preston Williams, Drew Locke. And yeah, so it's draft season. Good luck to you all in 2020 fantasy football. Eric, anything else you want to say before we go? Yeah, just a quick recap. I mean, I think we both did the mock pretty well for where we were. But again, if you're in a situation where you can choose your draft pick, especially this year, late rounds. I mean, I don't love it every pick they made but if you look at this 112 team or this 110 team and the team they have compared to ours all right yeah the 110 team took emmanuel sanders as their wide receiver too so a bit of mistakes but they had the opportunity to draft a good wide receiver too after hammering derrick henry aaron jones jonathan taylor aj brown great start to the draft Kenyon drake joe mixon alan robinson calvin ridley another great start to the draft is you want to be looking at those late first round picks if you can i mean i i'm not hating my team i'm not in love with it but I, that that's just personal preference for me and i think a lot of people in the fantasy community feel that way as well so if you are in a league where you like you compete for the top spot or you compete for choosing draft order try to target late in the first round if you can yep so that is going to do it for the video leave a like if you enjoyed subscribe if you are new i will have eric's channel in the description as well as the social media uh Follow me on Twitter. Link is in the bottom right this time, not in the top right. So anyways, guys, uh, have a good day and peace out.
can never ever find the right words and there's no way this is real life there's no telling you're the right girl so i can only say